Um, so I'm just going to take a little bit of a, a segue out now and just go and talk a little bit about tides because um, tides are important for estuaries and there's quite a lot of information available on the internet and in textbooks uh, which explain how tides work, uh, which is wrong. Okay, because tides is quite easy to get wrong. Tides are. Uh, but anyway, so one of, the, one of the, the characteristics of tides is that there are two tides a day. Okay, uh, and uh, if you ignore the fact that some of the tides are caused by the, the sun, um, for the moment, uh, we, have, we have a satellite, the moon, and that has a gravitational attraction, and that causes there to be a bulge of water over to one side of the Earth, and as the Earth rotates around, okay, that bulge stays in the same place relative to the moon, so we experience a high and then a low tide. Doesn't explain why we have a bulge over on the far side, okay, which is kind of a little bit counterintuitive, and I'll just go through why this is. Okay? So if we simplify our, um, our Earth to a circle, and we just consider three points on the Earth. We consider a point at the centre of the Earth, C, and two points on the surface of the Earth, one far away and one near to a large satellite that we call the Moon. Okay. So uh, you don't need to remember this formula, but you should know it anyway uh, because we're scientists. Uh, so the gravitational attraction equals the gravitational constant, which is 6.6 .6 something to an enormous number. Um, the mass of the thing you're being attracted to uh, divided by the, the, the distance between your, the two objects squared. Okay. And this is the distance between the sun and the moon. So you can work out what the gravitational attraction of the moon is, any point on the Earth. Okay? And it turns out that, that, that this distance, basically across the diameter of the Earth, is big enough for there to be a very small difference in the gravitational attraction at n, which is higher than the gravitational attraction at f. And these are the actual gravitational attractions. So you, you, I mean, the, the gravitational attraction that we experience now, because we're standing on the Earth, which is a very, very massive object that is very, very close to us, that is 9.8-ish, okay? So you can see that these numbers here are much, much smaller, okay? These are extremely tiny numbers, okay? Um, now, if we just consider those, those forces that are, that are acting on us because of the Earth, so they all act down towards the center of the Earth, okay? So at the surface of the Earth, the gravitational, blah, 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 the gravitational attraction is 9.8, and that's always down, okay? At the center of the Earth, the gravitational attraction is zero, because it all kind of cancels out. Um, so we have uh, these different vectors now. Okay, so we've got weak. These, I guess these, these arrows that are in dark are technically five orders of magnitude longer than the uh, light gray arrows. So I don't think the length is any way. Um, um, length is not important. Um, right. Um, Okay, so if we, if we add those together, okay, if we add that 9.8 and these tiny things here, we get these values here. Okay, so the, the overall gravitational attraction at the centre of the Earth is zero plus that small amount for the Moon, and at the surface here, it's minus nine because it's acting in the other direction, okay, plus uh, that uh, uh, going the other way, okay, so we've got these different things going on. Okay, so now what's going on at the center of the Earth. Now we know that the acceleration at the center of the Earth in this system must be zero, okay? Because the Earth is not accelerating towards the Moon, okay? It's being maintained by its angular momentum as it goes around the Moon, okay? So the, moon, the Earth does not orbit the Moon, but you can think of it in the system. If you stood on the Moon, it would look like the Earth was orbiting. Anyway, whatever. Um, so this means that we have to take away this, this force which must be opposing the gravitational attraction of the moon, which is the centrifugal or centripetal acceleration away. So uh, we can take that away. We take that away from all of those. We get, uh, we get, uh, yeah, we take those away for everything. We get slightly less than 9.8 and slightly less than 9.8, pointing <coughs> in both sides. So we know that that's less okay, than the real gravitational attraction that we're experiencing. So that means that there must, 
the, to make this number this small, there must be a small force outwards on that side and a small force outwards on that side. Okay? That is basically why we get an acceleration outwards this side and an acceleration outwards that side. So these, are, these vectors now, okay, you could do that same kind of maths for any point on the surface of the Earth. Now this is not the total acceleration. This is just the acceleration that is not due to the gravitational attraction of the Earth. Okay, so this is due to the gravitational attraction of the Moon. Okay, it's got nothing to do with the rotation of the Earth. Okay, this would still have a bulge here, a bulge here if the Earth wasn't rotating. Okay, it's because the Earth is effectively rotating around the Moon, which it's not. The Moon is rotating around the Earth, but kind of from the physics, it doesn't matter. Okay, so we need to think about what this means in terms of sea level. Okay, or the tides. Okay, so if we think about what's happening on the high tide side, this is a tiny, tiny change in gravitational pull. So it's not the, um, we don't get a high tide near the moon because the, um, the water's being pulled outwards towards the moon. Okay, because it's five orders of magnitude less than the gravitational attraction down. Okay, you can work out how much it would be, and it would be maybe a millimetre of sea level change. What is important, though, is if we move away from the, the pit that's right next to the moon, if we go to somewhere up here, say, okay, we can see that these vectors now are now tangential to the surface of the Earth, so they're kind of parallel. So they're at right angles to the gravitational attraction, so they can basically drag the water around the surface. So what's happening here is water is being dragged towards here and towards here and towards here and towards here, and it's that horizontal movement of water that causes the, the water to pile up. Okay, and that's what's causing our bulge. Like that. Ta -da. So that's why we get um, a high tide twice a day. So as the Earth rotates, these bulges stay fixed relative to the moon or to wherever the sun is. Um, and as the Earth rotates around, we experience barely a high tide, low tide, high tide, low tide, all that kind of stuff. Okay. So some little complexities to that is that the, uh, the moon and, in fact, also the sun are not exactly on the axis or parallel, perpendicular to the axis of rotation. So they're slightly off, and that causes one of these high tides. So if you're standing where Joe is here, you'd experience a, a much higher tide when you're looking towards the sun the, or the moon than on the other side. Okay, so you get a... what. Each high tide is not the same as the one immediately preceding it. Okay? And then I remove this simplicity or this complication that there's also the sun. It turns out the sun is actually more important than the moon in terms of tides. Um, uh, so we have these two uh, large bodies which are causing us to have these bulges. So when they're both lined up, we get like a double big bulge. Okay? Uh, and then uh, I guess a quarter of a month later, we get uh, the bulges that are kind of opposing each other. So that reduces the magnitude of the tidal cycle. So we can see that here. So this is a tidal record from, I think, somewhere in Australia, Adelaide. There you go. Um, and you can see here some nice features. So you can see that each high tides, the following ones, they're not. You get a big one, little one, big one, little one. Yeah, and that's because the uh, plane of the moon or the sun is not on the equatorial plane of the Earth. Um, and you can see how the magnitude of these tides change. So we get so spring tides here, where the moon and the sun are kind of lined up. And where they're not lined up, you get these um, Neeps tides, which are smaller in amplitude. So you get lots of different periods of change. And sometimes you get this thing called a dodge tide, where um, the two exactly cancel each other out, and you get nothing. So uh, that is the case if we didn't have any land. But because we have land on Earth, you can think of basically those, bulge, those tidal bulges as basically enormous planetary scale waves that just rotate around the Earth. Okay, there's that, the waves are still, the Earth is rotating. But as those waves move around the Earth, they, they get interrupted by the continents. So they don't form that nice smooth pattern. Um, so what this diagram, this is a tidal map. And what the important thing on here, first of all, are the white lines. So the white lines are, the, are the, basically the crest of that, that wave of water moving around the Earth every hour. So in the uh, North Atlantic, it's kind of the crest here. An hour later, it's here. An hour later, another hour later. It moves around in a circular motion. Okay? It moves around in a circular motion like that. It doesn't go, can't, because it can't move around the world. 
okay? Because the constant's in the way. Um, so we have these different, basically, sets of tidal waves moving around the ocean basins. Now, where the size of the ocean basin is a whole number fraction of the wavelength of these waves, so if, if the ocean basin was the size of the Earth, or half the size of the Earth, or a third of the size of the Earth, then you get a resonance. So once the tidal wave goes around once, it starts to build up and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what we see with the colours. So the colours are the size of this, the tides, okay, the magnitude. So you can see in some places, this resonance causes them to have very, very large tides. Okay, and you can see that kind of around the North Atlantic here. So this is just the right size of an ocean basin to start to build up big tides. And if you have wedge-shaped coastlines, okay, as this, this wave moves up the coastline, the tides get massively amplified. So you can see examples of that up in here. I can't remember this place in France, biggest tides in the world. Uh, and you get huge tides up in here. So when you get to Cardiff, you can get 13 meters of tide at springs, which is huge. You can just watch it come in. It's, just, um, it's incredibly dangerous if you're um, you know, fishing. Um, 